Thing with another change in Wabash Township. The latest development in that ongoing controversy just ahead. And now that Juneteenth is an official federal holiday, we're speaking with local activists why they say this is only the first step toward moving forward as a nation. You're watching News 18 at 6. News from where you live. Good evening, I'm Jeff Smith. Samantha Tiki is off tonight, thanks for joining us. We start tonight with weather because we've got a couple uh, interesting and potentially dangerous topics. A lot of heat moving in, as well as some potential for severe weather. Chad? Yeah, heat we'll start with. We've got the heat advisory just off to our southwest right now. This will likely be expanded north and east or by the National Weather Service with time. These are actually ozone alerts you see in the gray here. We got an ozone alert for Howard County. That just means the air is dirty if you've got asthma or prone to allergens. That alert is up until midnight for Howard County. Now this is where the heat is right now. This is the big hot upper ridge. This surges in tomorrow. Dangerous heat coming in and then we got the severe weather risk coming in a little bit in the morning in the north and then widespread by evening. Upper 80s to low 90s right now, but it's not humid at all. The air is extremely dry. That's going to change by tomorrow morning. In fact, it's so dry it feels cooler than the actual air temperature right now. This disturbance here means storms will do this clip our northeast counties. This disturbance here means severe weather by tomorrow evening. We'll talk about the main threats, the exact timing, and also dig into uh, you know, this earthquake we had today. Why did it occur near our area? Is this common here? And uh, why we feel earthquakes a little bit more here from just a tiny trembler compared to California? That's all coming up. All right, Chad, we'll see you in a few moments. An update now to a story that we've been following. The Wabash Township Trustee's Office is now closed. Trustee Jennifer Tysing is instead directing the public to her private residence in West Lafayette. Now here's a look at the sign that's been posted on the office doors. As we've reported, Tysing will terminate the township's three paid firefighters later this month. She blames the layoffs on budget shortfalls. The township board on Tuesday, though, approved a last minute money transfer that they say could keep the firefighters employed through 2023. Tysing, though, says she'll move forward with the layoffs. That's according to emails posted by the Wabash Township Fire Department Association. Here's a plea from the association's president during Tuesday's board meeting. We're asking you, please do not go through with your plan. For the benefit of everyone, and for the safety of our township, please do not do this. The township board is hosting an emergency meeting at 6 p.m. on Tuesday to discuss the future of the fire department. News 18 reached out to Tysing. So far, we have not received a comment. Well, 210 residents across three towns in Tippecanoe County have signed a petition opposing a pricey sewer project. Critics say the petition represents about 80 percent of the households in the proposed regional sewer district. They also pushed environmental experts to collect water samples this week from streams near those towns. News 18's Joe Paul reports they want to understand the extent of human pollution in the watershed. John DeLong is leading a group of citizens who are in opposition to a $9 million sewer project in Buck Creek, Americus, and Colburn. The project would replace those towns' aging septic tanks with a new sewer system. And as we've previously reported, authorities say many of those tanks were draining directly into Buck Creek and many other watersheds in northeast Tippecanoe County. Local and state health officials on Monday took water samples from the Buck Creek and Sugar Creek watersheds. To try to determine how much of the pollution in these creeks can be attributed to animals uh, upstream uh, versus the people here in the community. Colburn resident John DeLong has pushed for sampling since county commissioners proposed a costly sewer project in the area. We've been discouraged that the uh, the plan was really developed without testing uh, the, the water here. There was a general uh, idea that, that the creeks were, were fouled, but nobody had done any testing since 2012, and we thought that was a mistake. But Ron Knowles with the Tippecanoe County Health Department says these issues take time to investigate. He pointed to similar projects in other small towns. Stockwell took us 10 years, Romney nearly 12 years. 
So, uh, and all these unincorporated communities have the same issue, small lot size, severe soils, they were all built around streams, a off-lot discharge to the streams. It's part of a county-wide effort to update sewer infrastructure and improve water quality. County commissioners became proactive and looked into what we could do with these communities, unincorporated communities where uh, there is no sanitary sewer collection. DeLong also pointed to the new system in Stockwell, which he says is larger and serves more people for a lower monthly cost. Our investigation suggests that we can spend a lot less than that and save the people a lot of money and still make a significant uh, improvement in the water quality around here. DeLong has met individually with county commissioners. He's asking them to pause this project for 180 days. And this group of citizens has also drafted an injunction for a temporary restraining order. They say they're ready to take this case to the courts if that's necessary. Reporting in Buck Creek, Joe Paul, News 18. Our IU Health is urging people to donate blood because of a nationwide shortage. Donations not keeping up with demand. Blood is constantly used in the medical field. A big reason, the increase in emergency visitations. Other reasons, though, include delays in certain procedures because of COVID-19. Historically, blood donations tend to surge during times of crisis and after tragedies. But Dr. James Bean says getting the COVID vaccine will also help out. We still have a large number of people who are not vaccinated in our region and that, um, that is going to continue to impact us. We're still seeing double digit numbers of patients each day in our hospital with COVID. Well, Dr. Bean recommends blood donations be on your to-do list every 8 to 12 months. Sites like the Red Cross and Versati are available if you're interested in donating. Well, this afternoon, President Joe Biden signed Juneteenth as a federal holiday, the holiday had been celebrated for more than 150 years. News 18's Peter Hewlett has been talking to local residents about what the federal recognition of the day means for them, and he joins us now live in the studio with their thoughts. Hey there, Jeff. Well, Juneteenth is only just becoming a federal holiday, like you said. It's been celebrated across the country and right here in Greater Lafayette for years. And for those who have been celebrating, well, today is an important step forward. Juneteenth is now a federally recognized holiday. This comes just two days before the celebrations begin in Greater Lafayette. For Cornelius Byram, Associate Professor of History for Purdue University, it helps us to remember what shouldn't be forgotten. And so Juneteenth is a really, a really important symbol for um, recognizing the profound shortcomings of the nation when it comes to living its core principles. Juneteenth celebrates the news of emancipation arriving to Galveston, Texas, two years after the Emancipation Proclamation of 1863. While enslaved African Americans had been freed under the law, post-Reconstruction and Jim Crow laws have limited their freedoms. Bynum says with the federal recognition of Juneteenth, the country is making an important first step to recognizing its shortcomings. And first steps should be followed by, by other steps. And so long as that's the process, um, then I think it should be acknowledged and, and, and celebrated uh, as an achievement moving forward. But it can't be the only thing that the federal government does. Of course, Juneteenth has been celebrated by friends and families for years, including here in Greater Lafayette. Deanna McMillan is the Director for Advancement of the Baptist Student Foundation at Purdue. We were ahead of the curve, and that just goes to show. I'm from New York City, big city. But, you know, I've never been to a Juneteenth celebration in New York City. We had this plan before it became a national holiday. She echoes Bynum's belief that today is the day the country moves forward. So I think this is another step in that direction where we can say it out loud that there was an injustice done and we can move on and not dwell in that. And coming up this June, Juneteenth, a celebration is being put on by the Baptist Student Foundation. and It will be held at Tapawingo Park in West Lafayette from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. It's going to be free and open to the public. Reporting live in studio, Peter Hewlett, News 18. Peter, thank you very much. A new Indiana programs could allow thousands of people to get their driver's licenses back, but few people are taking advantage of it. What you need to know when we come back.
watching News 18 at 6. News from where you live. Indeed, we had an earthquake today. 3.8 magnitude just outside of the viewing area. Here's Lafayette. Here's Petersburg. Down here in Park County, Turkey Run State Park is right here. And there's the center right near Bloomingdale, Indiana. However, the waves of that quake expanded outward. And even though they became increasingly diffuse as they moved outward, we still felt it. Fowler, Lafayette, up towards Delphi, had reports in Kentland and Winnemucca feeling this brief quake and felt them quite a bit down towards Petersburg and Crawfordsville. The earth is like a hard boiled egg. You've got the soft, spongy, slick top and then the shells on top of the egg and these plates move around the planet where they split. You get volcanoes and quakes where they come together. You get earthquakes and mountain building. What we have is two plates that tried to split apart tens, hundreds of millions of years ago. So we've got this weakness in a plate, Wabash Valley Fault Zone and the New Madrid Fault Zone. In these two areas, we still get some earthquakes from time to time. When one plate moves, this weakness in our plate jars a little bit, you get an earthquake like that. But we feel it a lot more here, even when there's a slight earthquake compared to California. Reason being, where's the bedrock? The bedrock near the surface is south central Indiana. We have been covered by ice. We've had all our valleys filled in with sand, silt, gravel, glacial till. So our surface geology here is very loose. It's just sediments that are hundreds of feet deep. And when you get an earthquake in this sediment very deep in the earth, it's like poking a piece of jello. That jello wiggles around and that's the earthquake that we feel. So you'll feel a 3.8 a lot more here than you will out in California because the bedrock is so deep in the viewing area. Jeff. So state lawmakers and legal experts are reassessing state laws that were created decades ago to keep us all safe behind the wheel. It means thousands of Hoosiers are becoming eligible to get their driver's licenses back, but a lot of people have been slow to take advantage. Jill Glavin spoke with advocates who believe it could make our roads safer. The data was kind of what we expected, but still kind of, kind of shocking. As of earlier this year, more than 6% of Hoosiers, around 440,000 people, could not drive legally due to a suspended license. Help people kind of break out of that cycle. Indiana's traffic safety resource prosecutor, Chris Daniels, found the vast majority of them suspended due to administrative issues, stuck in a cycle of fines that can easily reach tens of thousands of dollars. 75 to 80% of the people suspended in the state were suspended for administrative fi financial reasons. Last year, a law went into effect that was supposed to help by allowing people to petition a court to cut their outstanding fees in half. The law only applied in 2020, and I requested data from Indiana's court system and found out not many people took advantage of it. The data shows around 4,300 petitions for traffic amnesty filed last year. Almost all of those, more than 4,000, were filed in Marion County, representing as little as 5% of the county's suspensions. It wasn't as well known as we would have liked it to have been. Prosecutor Ryan Mears believes for many suspended drivers, the petition is just one step in a much more complicated process. And it's really difficult for people to figure out, okay, number one, why was I suspended and what can I do uh, to, to work through this suspension process? Mears' office started its own second chance program to help people untangle their driving records and get licenses back. Their next workshop later this month revealed how many people want the help. We had 375 spots and they filled up in 48 hours. We're taking so many people out of the workforce because they don't have a, a driver's license, which precludes them from employment. We know that there's a large amount. That's a big reason Daniels worked with state legislators on a new law. On January 1st, many suspended drivers will be able to get their licenses back by simply paying for and keeping insurance. Daniels believes the law will be more effective at cutting down on suspensions, thus ensuring more people driving on Indiana's roads are doing so at less risk to their fellow drivers. We have a lot of people who otherwise are law-abiding citizens who want to follow the law, who want to do what they're supposed to do, but simply can't afford to. And that's not what the law was ever designed to do. Again, that was Jill Glavin reporting. Some drivers who filed petitions last year were able to get their licenses back when their fees were reduced. Courts would be able to consider those petitions again beginning on July 1st. 
a Precision 18 Chief Meteorologist uh, Chad Evans. He is tracking that scorching heat and chances for thunderstorms ahead as well. He has a full look at our forecast coming up next. And now, your Precision 18 forecast. News 18, weather from where you live. All right, we've got four weather stories. Dangerous heat, severe weather, a brief but significant cool down, and then we're back to intense heat late next week. This evening, just a few patchy clouds around. Winds out of the south southwest, low humidity, though it's going to be hot at 90 at 7, 78 by 11 o'clock and then overnight some increasing clouds, some storms possible in our far northern and northeastern counties. Wind picks up, but only down to 75 and it gets much more humid. The record heat they're having in the west, a piece of that is bulging eastward and on the outer fringe of that, we're going to have severe storms, clusters of severe storms that develop. There's one developing here. There'll be another one here that eventually develops and impacts us. And then we've got more that will come in a little bit on the weekend, but especially on Monday. Monday, though, the ridge contracts, moves to the west, and with that, cold front comes through. But what that will do is not only cool us off, end this intense heat briefly, but it will take likely Hurricane Claudette at that point, pull it in Louisiana, and rather than moving up our way, it will just get pushed off to the east coast and all the heavy rain will stay south of our area as our little trough or a little bit of cool air comes in. And again, the hot dome moves west briefly. Upper 60s to mid 70s will do it tonight and getting very humid late. Tomorrow, dangerous heat, 94 to 101 for the high hottest day since 2012 around here, July of 2012. Heat indices around 100 to as high as 111. Be extra careful tomorrow, still hot on Saturday and humid. Not quite as bad as tomorrow, though, but still highs running 90 to 96. Heat indices near 100 or exceeding it. Enhanced risk right here for severe weather tomorrow over much of the viewing area. Main threat is wind. Can't rule out an isolated tornado, isolated large hail, a little bit of heavy rain. Main time frame is 9 p.m. tomorrow evening to 1 a.m. tomorrow night. However, I want you to notice our far northeastern counties tonight. Clouds increasing. This is 6 a.m. tomorrow morning, between 6 and 8 tomorrow morning. I think this is the best chance at getting storms. The model's going pretty far southwest with the storms. I think this is a more likely scenario that our northeast gets clipped by severe storms. Again, some gusts of 60 miles an hour possible. Those move on. Then we're dry and searing heat will dominate the afternoon. But watch what happens. 
between 9 and 1 a.m. tomorrow evening. We're okay for a while, but here come the storms in from the west. Here's your line. Wind threat, isolated tornado or two, isolated large hail comes in, rakes the area and moves out. We see we may still have a couple scattered storms Saturday, Sunday with isolated severe weather risk, followed by more widespread severe risk on Monday. New blog post up on your Precision 18 weather app coming up later this evening. 95 Saturday and Sunday, 94 Monday, but there's the cool down. 77 Tuesday before we heat back up Thursday. All right.